homelessness is a problem that's in many ways just like puberty, right? Which is that like... Homelessness you know, is just like puberty. You heard it here first. Like, in the sense that there's genetic effects on people's biology and then there's how our social and legal environment responds to that. In the US, a serious mental illness is one of the biggest risk factors for being homeless. It seems like you've had a spicy few years of controversy. <laughs> Do you think that's fair to say? Um, I don't think I've ever heard the word spicy before to describe it, but I do think that it's fair to say that there's been a couple years of controversy. Yes. I'm pretty fascinated by your positioning because doing behavioral genetics, which for good or for ill has kind of been adopted by some people on the right, um, but your political leanings are toward the left. So you occupy this sort of very difficult space in between why why do you think it is that you consistently find yourself in the eye of the storm of these debates yeah, that is a very good question that i've asked myself um on a number of occasions recently you know i i think there are people that walk into things sort of deliberately courting controversy sort of seeing okay what can i say that's going to be provocative and that genuinely has not been kind of my approach or experience. It really has kind of felt this kind of bewildering, dislocating experience in which I say things that seem just true to me. And then it is only by saying them out loud that I realize that they are controversial and, and in fact, almost never controversial when each statement is taken on its own. It's something about the combination of them, like the package of them that seems to provoke strong feelings um but you know like i'm a professor i'm an academic i feel like you know, i have this great privilege of getting to think about things that i think are important and thinking out loud about them with my students and in my research papers and then more recently with kind of more public facing work and my goal in all of this has just been to really articulate like what do i think is true like what do i think is true from a scientific perspective and what do I think is true in terms of um, expressing my own personal like political and moral convictions? And it just turns out that if you repeatedly say true things um, in this space, that seems to rile up um, pretty strong feelings, I, I think, on both sides of the political spectrum, which is interesting. Why do you think people are so uncomfortable with behavioral genetics generally? Oh, you know, there's this really great paper by a legal scholar, Dov Fox, where he talks about genetics and to a lesser extent neuroscience as subversive science. And I love that phrase, subversive science. And he's what he's arguing is that it can subvert really basic intuitions that we have about um, agency or equality. I don't actually think it has to be subversive in quite those ways. I think sometimes the perceived subversiveness of behavioral genetics rests on misunderstandings of it. Like if properly understood many of the fears of the ways that genetics will subvert our values of equality or agency or identity, um, you know, turn out to not be true. But we live in a secular age in which people often don't believe in souls anymore and so they've substituted genes as kind of their essence placeholders is the way that some people talk about it. And so when you start talking about genetics, I think ultimately you're talking about people's selves. You're, talk, you're talking about things about themselves that they, they value or cherish or fear um, or things they see in their children. So, you know, to some extent, I don't think that you can talk about genetics and humans without there being some emotion attached to it. And that's probably a good thing that we want to preserve our sense of something, um, something sacred about our humanness, even in a secular age. Yeah, sacred is the word that I had on the tip of my tongue there as well. You think about the successes that you have, the failures that you have, the things you value in yourself, the idiosyncrasies, your inclination toward playing this sport or not, toward having a family or not, all of these things, we like to consider ourselves as having some sort of agency. And yeah, the conception that you can be anything that you want to be, that living in a meritocracy where you get to choose your own route, that your failures and your successes are yours to bear, 
there's a lot of uh, waves clashing. It's like the Bermuda Triangle of awkward mm-hmm. tidal forces all crashing up against <laughs> each other. Yeah. No, I think that's true. There is something that we... Um, I think many modern people resist the idea of constraint, the idea that there is constraint, that, you know, that that we are not just these kind of like disembodied minds that have free and infinite potential to choose any future for ourselves. But in fact, even many of our choices are constrained by like our embodied biology. I think people find that idea really um, alienating. And then I also think, you know, people, it's not just genetics. Um, you know, there's this quote in my book from the novelist and essayist E.B. E. White. Like most people know him from the children's book, Charlotte's Web, but he also wrote um, for the New Yorker for many years and has this book of essays. And there's a quote from it, which is, you can't speak of luck to a self-made man. And he's what he's getting out there is that when you've had some success, there is a lot of our psychology that kind of kicks in to justify it as like, I earned this, like, look how hard I worked for this. And people can feel enraged, actually, when you say, well, you worked for it, but also that work was scaffolded by all of this luck. And some of that luck is environmental and some of that luck is sort of your embodied biology I think people can often feel like you're trying to take their success away from them or take away a source of pride away from them, which is not what I'm trying to do. Um, I think I'm more trying to engender a sense of, of gratitude that you've been given things that, you know, you, you didn't earn, you didn't necessarily deserve. And, and also a sense of compassion for people who haven't had the same luck um, in certain ways. What are you trying to do with this book then? That's such a good question. You know, I ask myself all the time, like, how did I get myself into this? Um, I, I think I'm storm. trying to do a couple. <laughs> I'm trying to do a couple different things. So I think I'm trying to one just explain what genetics is up to these days, right? Like a lot of times you hear this phrase, "We're in the middle of a DNA revolution," and I think we are from the perspective of science's ability to measure people's DNA directly, cheaply, non-invasively at scale. That would have seemed like science fiction two decades ago. Um, So I think that is going to affect people's lives. And there are so many myths and misunderstandings about what genetics can say and what it can't say about psychological differences between people. So part of what I'm trying to do this book is just to explain as a researcher and a professor in this field, like to the best of my ability, explain it in a way that's clear so that people can understand and clear up some of the myths. And then also, you know, I I have realized since I've been doing this work for such a long period of time that many people find it profoundly unintuitive to think that genetics matters and also to consider yourself a political liberal, as someone who's really invested in the idea of social equality as a, as a political project. Um, and so, whereas those two things feel quite consonant in my mind, like they feel like they fit together quite nicely. Um, and I've never, you know, in an academic paper, like, you know, it's 4,000 words. You maybe have like a thousand words for the discussion. You can maybe squeeze in like two sentences somewhere to explain an idea, whereas a book gives you space to expound on something that um, I think is important, that I think is counterintuitive for many people, um, that I think, uh, that I hope changes the conversation, like stretches the conversation so that there's kind of new space and it's not running in quite the same tracks that it's been running in um, for such a long time. What do you mean by social equality? Because that term (laughs) is very fraught. Yes, yes. Um, it's always equality of what. So I actually mean it quite, um, quite simply, which is what are the ways in which people's lives turn out differently in a society? So if we look at the end of people's lives, we can think there's differences in physical health. Um, how long do you live? How physically healthy are you? Your risk for disease. We can look at differences in psychological well-being, um, 
serious mental illness, but also depression and anxiety and well-being. And do you think your life is worth living? Um, and then uh, more economic outcomes. So we can think about income or wealth or labor market participation, levels of education. What's interesting about those three domains of inequality of outcome now compared to previous times in human history is that in the US and in the UK, they're really bound up with one another and, and, and really bound up in particular with education. So if we look back several hundred years ago at the lifespans of nobility versus commoners, you didn't actually see that people who were at the top of the pecking order lived that much longer than commoners like the plague came for them all right like there were communicable diseases were the primary cause of death and you know that you didn't have these huge disparities in physical health whereas now what you see is that you know the most educated people they don't just make more money they live longer they live healthier lives and they enjoy their lives more and i think when you start thinking about that cluster of inequality in which a very educated slice of the population is getting more of everything. Those are the types of social inequalities that I'm really interested in. And what's the sort of outcome that you would want from this? Because we can't flatten society for everything. <laughs> you can't just have this homogenous gray sort of yeah. top color painted across everything. It can't be vanilla all the way down. Yeah. No, and I don't want it to be. I mean, I think... But there must be some constraints. The, at, at what point do you... Yeah. Uh, do, where does the boundary lie for what you consider should be something which is within this sort of mandate? Yeah, yeah. So I think when we're thinking about, um, like, this question of, like, what should be equalized, right? Like, oftentimes people immediately go to resources, right? Like, should we equalize income? Or should we equalize opportunities to go to college, and I think, you know, the scale of inequality in income, particularly in the U.S., like we could argue is inefficient and a problem. What I'm more interested in is equality of like one kind of basic things that we owe to fellow humans as kind of as a kind of a necessary part of reflecting their human dignity. So a huge thing in the U.S. is healthcare, right? That like millions of people don't have access to the healthcare. They can't go to the doctor when they're sick. Um, I think nothing explains America and American poverty quite so much as seeing, you know, fill your own dental cavity kits in Walmart, right? Like those are the sorts of things where it doesn't really matter to me, like whether or not you've not gone far in school because you didn't have the ability versus you just didn't care about like you just you know like you're just bored by it and you'd rather do something else like you'd rather be a mechanic than a chemist like go forth in life there are things that you still are think are owed as part of being just being a human in our society um that right now we really do particularly in america structure according to education in a way that i think is unnecessary and we don't have to look that far to other, you know, high income countries that say, um, you know, we want people to go far in school. We think it's instrumentally useful to, you know, have people who do certain things get paid more. We're not going to send you home to die if you have cancer because you don't have health insurance. Right. Like, I think there, there's really basic things like that. I also think there's, you know, this increasing. um like disrespect and sort of degradation of prestige for the types of labor that aren't the sort of things that like I do, right? Like I'm really good at rotating abstract information in my head and like working in a computer. That's not manual skill. That's not emotional labor, like in service of retail or waitressing, which was, you know, waitressing was the hardest job I ever had in my life. Um, so we have these narratives right now around like essential workers, um, who don't have control over their schedule, who don't have access to health insurance, who don't have like the kind of financial stability that allows them to think I could have a family, like I could own a home. Um, and that's not because their labor isn't valuable to society. It's because we've devalued that labor. So those are like those kind of things about like healthcare freedom from financial anxiety, like having enough material security so that you feel like you can get married and start a family 
like not being constantly evicted from your home. We can think about equalizing those and it's not some Soviet dystopia, right? Like that's not like a gray, like that's like Finland, right? Like I'm describing things that do exist in the world, um, but that are forms of inequality, like really persistent inequality that, um, that we justify often, particularly in America, according to these guidelines of like meritocracy in education. Explain for me the link between that and genetics and DNA, because yeah. to me that just sounds yeah. like policies that the government <laughs> needs to sort. Like we've got yeah. we've got the NHS yeah. in the UK, so we fix the healthcare problem. You put yeah. UBI in, therefore you fix the uh, the I- income problem. The prestige thing yeah. is a cultural um, artifact of the way that people view particular different jobs. So you'd have to have some sort yeah. of retraining. So these, to me, I don't see the link between that uh, and the genetics. Yeah. Side. Yeah. No, I mean, like, that's such a, like, that's such a good observation because I, I feel like what you're picking up on is like part of why I get surprised when people think that I'm a very controversial thinker because like my bottom line on the, for many things is, you know, there should be a floor, there should be a social safety net beyond which people can't fall, um, which isn't hugely controversial in large segments of the population. I think where genetics comes in is in two ways. So the first is, you know, even if you're, even if we say, regardless of how people do in school, they should have a certain access to a quality of certain quality of life. um, We're still also interested in improving the, how people do in school. We're still interested in improving how children learn. And a big part of the book is invested in describing how ignoring genetics makes that project harder. Like if we do research that's predicated on the assumption that children are all genetically the same when they're not, like the research base on which we're building our policies and interventions to try to help children succeed in education have predictable problems, which is that they don't work. Like what most of what are the are genetic different. differences in outcomes based on genetic markers? Yeah. So, I mean, just to back up a second, like if we look at, um, you know, there's kind of two ways to, to study this. And so one is just looking at twins or adoptive adopt adoptees. So looking at family members who differ in their genetic and social relationships in some way. And those have, those types of studies have long suggested that, you know, things like intelligence test score performance, but also personality traits like conscientiousness and planfulness Um, educationally relevant disorders like ADHD or conduct problems are all heritable, which means that like part of the reason why children are different on these things is because they have different genes. And then more recently, there have been studies that identify specific genetic variants. So specific DNA differences between people that are correlated with these different outcomes. And it's, you know, the, that science has progressed so rapidly that it's really forced social scientists to pay attention to it because now these genetic markers are as strongly correlated with say the likelihood of going to university as uh, variables like family income are. So what's the, what's the sort of correlation that you find between either parents and children or genetic markers and outcomes in IQ or academics? Yeah. Yeah. So when we're talking, so I guess like there's a number of different numbers you can throw around. I I would say like the, maybe a touchstone is to think about like, what is the correlation between a polygenic score, which is, you know, kind of a summary of someone's DNA information. It's capturing environmental processes, but it's calculated just from your, their DNA and rates of college completion in the U.S. And that correlation is like between 0.25 and 0.3, which isn't huge, but is about the same size as you get between like family SES and going to college. You can make that number smaller by being like, well, what is the correlation when you're looking at within siblings? You can make that correlation bigger when you're like, well, that's not capturing all the genetics. What if you're looking at everything, not just what's measured in a polygenic score? Um, you know, the, that's like an active area of scientific debate. Like, I think what's important is whatever the number is, it's not zero, right? There are meaningful genetically associated differences between children and the outcomes that we care about 
really at every every stage of the educational process. So like Robert Plowman in the UK, who I know you've had on, has like with this with regards to um, like exam scores at age 16. I've looked at it in relation to like which math class do you get tracked into in the ninth grade? Um, we can project whether or not people stay in math, even knowing their grades in their previous year from their DNA, right? So like among students who are all in the same school and they all got Bs, like the DNA predicts which ones stay in math versus drop out of math. So as soon as we're talking about those types of correlations in the 0.2 to 0.3 range, they're not large, but none of our correlations for things that we measure in kids like school going are large. Um, and we can start to like use them in our studies. Um, so that, that was, I feel like we've, we followed a little tangent. I don't remember the original question, but basically we now can, we now can measure DNA and assess its association with outcomes we really care about, still with a great deal of uncertainty, but with enough certainty that we can see that it is making a difference, right? And at the same time, most of the kind of work in child development is not paying attention to that, right? So it's continuing to study parenting or school environments or neighborhood environments in relation to child outcomes. And there's this huge flaw at the heart of so much of that research, which is that children get more than their environments from their parents. And that flaw is really holding us back from designing better interventions, designing better policies to help children succeed in school. Um, so to put that together, my argument is kind of two pronged, which is that I think we need genetics in order to do the sort of science to help children succeed. And at the same time, knowing that genetics makes a difference is not some huge barrier to the political project of improving people's lives. They're, they, you know, as you said, like you have the NHS, like you don't need genetics for that. And both of those things can be true at the same time. I had a conversation after the Robert Plowman episode went up and I, I got to, uh, how would you say, I got to circle the outside of the whirlwind briefly uh, while that one went up. <laughs> Uh, the one that you sit in the middle of sometimes. And uh, a buddy replied, who's very familiar with the behavioral genetics research, and he said, thousands and thousands of parenting books out there, zero that include behavioral genetics research. One book on behavioral genetics beats five books on normal developmental <laughs> parenting. And yeah. that sort of really hit it home for me. I was like, that it makes a lot of sense. What I'm interested to try and find out is what... What are you proposing? Okay, we can make some sort of predictions based on genetic markers yeah. about a child's uh, predisposition in school. They're going to be good at maths or shit at English, or maybe they're just going to be higher IQ, lower IQ. Maybe they're autistic, maybe whatever, whatever. Like, what do you propose that people do yeah. from there? Schools, policy yeah. makers? Yeah. So I propose, I would say three general things. I think the first is my fellow researchers who are writing the stuff that goes into the parenting books, high income parents do this and that makes their kids better. They should be routinely integrating something about genetics into their research. So long as they're trying to figure out what aspects of parenting or school environments or neighborhood environments, like actually make a difference for children's lives. It's not that nothing makes a difference. It's that kind of reverse engineering what are the actual ingredients of change in effective schools and effective parents in, you know, in neighborhoods that foster achievement that are opportunity zones? That's a really hard scientific problem. And we can be making better progress at solving that if in the same way that researchers like routinely control for socioeconomic status when they're trying to say reading to kids matters, like let's make genetics part of like the the everyday work and all work a day arsenal of social scientists. I think for policymakers um, and interventionists that are doing policy evaluation or randomized control trials of educational interventions, anyone that's like doing an experiment tinkering with something and seeing if it works. I also think that they should be when they can, including genetic information, so that they can get beyond just seeing, does an intervention work on average for the average child? 
and instead get at are the interventions I'm trying serving the most vulnerable, serving the kids who are most at risk for poor outcomes. So moving beyond this to focus on the average kid that doesn't exist to heterogeneity of intervention effects, heterogeneity of policy evaluation. And then I think the third thing is like, you know, again, I I won't speak to the UK context because I don't live there. I don't live in that political climate. Like I live in Texas. I live in a state in which people are often very opposed to any idea of redistribution and very pro-meritocracy and buttress those political beliefs with a really earnest commitment to the idea that any success they have, they earned it. And I would like people to consider the role of luck and in particular genetic luck in their successes and think about if, if this is in part because you got lucky rather than because you're good. What does that mean about your commitments to other people? I I just want people to consider that question and take it seriously. How would you differentiate between luck and effort? Effort. I mean, it's kind of an impossible thing because I think, you know, what you see is that our genes shape our personality and then our personality shapes um, what we how much effort we put into well this things, was a this right? was a question yeah. that I was going to say, so let's say that you had two students in the same school with similar genetic predispositions for maths and English and stuff, and one works harder than the other. Is that a problem? Well, if conscientiousness has a genetic marker in it, then you go, okay, do we need to somehow control for the child's predisposition <laughs> at working hard like yeah. you know questions out of the window with regards to free will for a philosophical yeah. debate. Like, what's <laughs> yeah. left on the table for us to actually yeah. bear as no, our own? I mean, you're you're exactly right. Like, there there's a great essay by the philosopher Thomas Nagel, and it's about this question of moral luck, right? Which things that are lucky, but that we're still responsible for. And he was like, if we take, you know, if we eliminate kind of the role of luck in human lives, like what's left over shrinks to an extensionless point, right? Like there's essentially nothing left once we start to take into this account that like luck shapes personality, which shapes effort. Like there's no getting rid of luck in your life. Um, For me, what that says, and I, you know, I'm borrowing this idea from political philosophers. um, You know, the philosopher John Rawls said, none of our precepts of justice tilt towards dessert which is basically what I was saying, like this whole political project of trying to figure out like what people deserve and what people earn in order to justify inequality is bound to fail because there is no separating like effort from luck. It's turtles all the way down. What we should thinking be thinking about is, you know, what inequality is instrumentally useful, right? Like rewarding some people more for certain types of work is better for everyone if it increases certain types of, um, productivity or is more efficient in the allocation of certain goods or resources. That's a different argument than saying I deserve my salary because I'm so clever, right? Like, um, so I'm not trying to say like, I'm not trying to disappear agency out of people's lives. I'm trying to get people to consider that if they are quote unquote successful in the sense that they enjoy a certain level of economic goods, in our like winner takes all meritocratic rat race um, that looking to their own lives and thinking about how much they deserve it and earn it might be missing part of the story. It's I mean, missing. If, if you as a scientist are struggling to be able to bifurcate those two, the person themselves <laughs> with all of their biases and their self love, yeah. it's Just essentially try. an impossible task. And there'll be yeah. someone who's, worked really hard or feels like they've worked really hard and has overcome their demons and they've had setbacks and they've had this, that and the other, and they've fought their way to the top. My business partner standing on the shoulder of his his children's names to try and climb out of the working class into the middle class and whatever it is that they do to try and get there. And then they think, well, hang on a second. Are you telling me that I should have somehow been pulled further back because I had a starting line head start genetically? This was me. This was my agency. This was what I did. There's a concern that people feel like they're just... Uh, outcomes are going to be taken away from them. Yeah. So I feel like that's, I mean, that's such an interesting, and we've gotten so far away from genetics, but this idea that it's, that by equality, we mean leveling down or by equality, we mean pulling back or by equality, we mean 
taking things away from them um, versus the ways in which everyone, even the person, even the person at the top is better off when things are more equal. And this is something that like, I think can be profoundly counterintuitive. Um, but we see it's true that like people who live in more unequal societies are less happy. They're more anxious even when they're at the top of the hierarchy, because there's this still sense of like felt precarity I have to maintain, like at all times, like I can't let myself fall down or my children fall down. You know, this, the idea that everything in life is this relentless competition um, with no, no margin for error. It doesn't just hurt the losers of the competition. It also hurts the winners. Um, You know, I, I genuinely think that like, Jeff Bezos in the long term will be better off if he has like 100 million fewer dollars, but lives in a society in which there's more political stability and like fewer supply chain issues for Amazon because like laborers who unload the boxes are like adequately paid enough and not dying of COVID. Like there are ways in which it's not actually a zero sum game when we are talking about like equality and people immediately go to this, like you're trying to take something away from people at the top. That's the fear. people at the top are hurt by inequality too. Yeah. I, uh, I got sent a study by Rob Henderson just before I came on and he said that people in low class, the lower classes are more concerned with policies that raise up poverty but people in the upper classes are more concerned with policies that reduce inequality. Lower classes want poverty reducing, but upper classes want inequality reducing. That seemed quite surprising to me. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I haven't read that study, but, you know, people have, like, you know, I also wonder, like, to what extent that's about what aspects of inequality or are most affecting you, right? So, you know, I'm a like an upper middle class affluent person who lives in a very unequal city. Um, you know, when I think about like what is hurting Austin, I think about like, well, how is the concentration of wealth warping the housing market? How is the concentration of wealth warping like the educational system when people can opt out of public schools and go to private schools? Um Whereas, so that set of concerns is really focused at like, to what extent is the concentration of wealth and like the 0.01% changing the conditions of livability for all of us, right? That's different from someone who is existing like at the poverty line and is really interested in like, how can I make sure that like I have secure housing and I have secure food and like I can send my kids to school at all. Um, Ultimately though, I think our our concerns about both alleviating poverty and eliminating inequality, there's points of political intersection between those, like, you know, particularly around like housing and affordable housing. Um, But I do think that's really interesting. Like, you know, whether you're, whether you're more interested in like compressing the scale of inequality writ large versus specifically raising the floor, like people have different priorities around that for sure. Getting back to genetics then, what are (laughs) some of the more surprising correlations that you found? I I saw a bit about when identical twin sisters have marriages with different levels of conflict, their children have (laughs) equal risk for delinquency. What are some of the other ones like that? Well, I mean, that project is part of most of my graduate work, which is attempting to address this problem that we've talked about before. And the problem being that most studies just correlate aspects of parenting and child outcomes and then are like, oh, well, this aspect of parenting is like the secret sauce, right? So, you know, there's 8 million studies that are parents who fight more have more behavior problems. Like, this is why you should learn to get along with your spouse more because it's going to help your kids ADHD. And like very few considering that like argumentative parents might have argumentative children, like for reasons other than just environmental modeling. Um, So my graduate work was a lot on like kind of divorce, marital conflict, age at childbearing, like, you know, as teenage pregnancy, like actually bad for kids. Um, What did that come up with? What did that suggest? 
Um, it's just that like teenage moms definitely face a lot more like financial problems than mothers who delay childbearing. Like there's, there's, um, you know, there's a penalty to early motherhood in terms of education in the labor market. Um, but the effect of adolescent parenthood on kids, particularly their like um, cognitive problems and ADHD is a lot smaller than people might anticipate. And, you know, and that's because um, people do not have children as teenagers at random, right? So like, more impulsive sensation seeking moms are more likely to have kids young and they're more likely to have impulsive sensation seeking kids. Um, so there's just a lot like going back to your, you know, there's 8 million parenting books, which are all like, here are all the things correlated with me, like a high and in, high income white lady basically is what they're, they're all saying. Um, and very few of those things are shown to actually have like a causal impact on child development like it's just like let's see what's in fashion amongst people in a certain social class and then like give us give give parents a lot of advice (laughs) based on that not really on like tons of solid science i couldn't believe that girls who hit puberty earlier are less likely to do maths oh that that was surprising to you well you weren't a girl i guess yeah i mean i I didn't (laughs) think that if you're a girl who hits puberty sooner the boys that are in the maths class are going to hit on you because you're the one that's developing. And it makes complete, it makes complete sense. I don't disbelieve it for a moment, but I was like, Oh yeah. But that's because when girls go from being a girl to being a woman, something sort of attractive happens to the boys that are looking at them. When boys go from being boys to men, nothing happens. Like essentially (laughs) nothing changes. Their voice just gets a bit weird and they get spotty. So it's so interesting. You know, I just taught my adolescent development lecture because I teach intro psych, which is great to teach adolescent development because they're all freshmen, right? So they're 18. They just went through this. Some of them are still going through this. And I teach a really big online class. And so I put them into chat rooms all the time where they can talk to each other. And I was like, so their chat prompt was, do you wish you could have gone through earlier, through puberty earlier or later? And all of the girls are like, I wish that it happened later. Like I was the first one in my class. It was embarrassing. It was discouraging. Men are skeevy. Boys start to look at you totally differently. Like, you know, my parents treated me differently, which is true. Like the research literature show, like girls go through puberty a little earlier than boys anyways. And so the earliest maturing girls look like women and the boys in their class look like boys. Um, but that doesn't stop the boys from being like creepy to them in a lot of ways. And so, whereas the boys were like, I couldn't wait, like my voice cracked. And I was like, when is the rest of this? I still can't grow a beard. I'm still waiting for this. And I think it's interesting. I mean, I think it's actually a great example of like, there's what genes do to your body. And then there's how society responds to your body, right? Like going through puberty is very heritable you know, like that's kind of like a developmental timing thing. Um, but then you have breasts and hips and your, your, your social environment and your teachers and your parents are responding to you differently. And so it's, um, we sometimes use the phrase environmentally mediated genetic effects. Like it's the effect of your genes on your body that then becomes like the grist for the social mill and like the social response that you're getting from people. And so when you see that, like, girls who go through puberty early are less likely to take advanced math classes, is that a genetic effect? Well, like, going through puberty earlier is genetic. But then there's also, like, the social construction of girlhood and of of sexual gender dynamics between adolescents that, like, is responsible for that outcome. That highlights exactly what I was saying earlier on, that there's two elements at play there. You can try and control for the culture or you can try and control for the genetics because the yeah. outcome or the the impact that you're trying to avoid yeah. is something yeah. which occurs culturally but there's two ways that we can play around with this you know do yeah. do you need to have a maths class for all of the girls that are early developers like oh <laughs> looks like looks like or just a maths class for all of the girls right like to just not be in you know to just uh to be able to be in stem education free of 
uh, men who dominate the conversation, right? Like some people have attempted to, you know, does that matter for girls' outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. And then think about some of the externalities that you might have from that. Then you would have women who eventually end up in the workplace and haven't had sufficiently long to be able to work out how to communicate with men and men who wouldn't understand how to communicate with women. And from what I know, the men in STEM could do with a bit of a assistance <laughs> with learning how to talk to women in any case. So Right. What about homelessness? You were talking about Austin and obviously there's, yeah. I've seen quite a lot of stories about the homelessness problem in Austin and you also researched that and its links to genetics. Well, yeah. I mean, so homelessness is a, is a problem that's exactly, I mean, in many ways, just like puberty, right? Which is that like... Homelessness you know, is just it. like puberty. Pay card and you heard it. You heard <laughs> it here first. Like the little clip that we have here. In the sense that there's genetic effects on people's biology. And then there's how our social and legal environment responds to that. So we know that there are genetic influences on mental illnesses like schizophrenia. And we also know that in the U.S., a serious mental illness is one of the biggest risk factors for um, being homeless. And there's a long history behind that, right? Like we had a massive deinvestment in psychiatric care in the United States. We had a big deinstitutionalization movement of like shutting down the inpatient wards and like getting people out of hospital. Um, we don't have enough psychiatric beds or public housing in the United States. And so what happens to someone who's seriously mentally ill and whose family doesn't have enough resources to pay for psychiatric health care for them, they're very likely to end up on the streets. Um, Austin has been in this terrible, like, we're going to criminalize camping. We're not going to, we're going to decriminalize camping. We're going to recriminalize camping. And it's like just futzing around at the symptoms of the problem, right? Like, it's not... The problem isn't whether or not an unhoused person can use a tent. It's that they don't have a house and we haven't addressed as a society the structural issues that go into them being unemployed, unhoused. So, again, we have like, you know, your genes affect your risk of experiencing psychotic symptoms. It's our social choice that people with psychotic symptoms are on the street instead of in the hospital. Like the biggest psychiatric care provider in the United States is the jail system. Like more schizophrenics are in prison versus like in hospital. Um, so that is like, we can think about genes to biology and then what's happening to a person in their social environment based on that biology. Um, homelessness is a, is a great example of that. There's another element where you're talking about separating characteristics and the difference between how valued some characteristics are and how valuable someone is yeah. in society. Can you dig into that? Yeah. I mean, I think when we're, when we're talking about um, intelligence, when we're talking about homelessness, when we're talking about conscientiousness, um, when we're talking about uh, economists often use the word skilled, skilled labor, there can be this idea that if traits are associated with genes, that that's evidence that some people are sort of inherently more valuable than other people, right? That they're genetically smarter or they're genetically more moral or whatever. And I don't think that's true. I think what we see is that there's a wide variety of genetic differences between us and also a wide variety of skills and talents and traits. And then we now live in a, in a system that systematically values some skills and traits over others, right? Like going back to you talking about you and your friend growing up working class, you know, why do we think of being a university professor as being a quote unquote better job than being a mechanic, right? Like we can't really function very well as a society without mechanics. Like we need mechanical knowledge, but it is a, it is a type of training and a type of skill that's devalued relative to, you know, maybe what a university professor is doing, what kind of skills they have. And what I'm trying to call attention to is that that's not some fixed and inflexible like law of nature that is choices that we've made as a society, right? That to say, like, if you have these skills, you have access to these types of jobs that come with these types of material conditions. And if you have these skills, you're allowed to hoard all sorts of wealth and opportunity. 
there's nothing like fixed in fixed in nature about that. That is the result of social choices. So I do agree. Yeah. However, I I would struggle to justify saying that the guy that sits on his couch in his house of three other dudes smoking weed and playing Xbox all day is as valuable as as contributive of a member of society as the mechanic or the university professor or the bus driver or anybody else, right? Like, I understand that you can say this is genes and environment for most of the way down, that this person is the, the nail on the end of the finger of the arm of the position that they were given of the life that that they've been leading that's currently being yeah. grown out of the earth but i i can't what about the freeloader there has to, that, the, the, the rubber has to, the rubber has to meet the road at some point it's like look we yeah. have to make people culpable for some of the things that they do yeah so we i mean we definitely already do that right like i would say like you know in terms of people being people given not being given many chances and people being at high risk for experiencing a lot of poverty and immiseration um, if they're not quote unquote contributing. Like, I feel like that's in many ways like a defining feature of the American political landscape. Um, and people, you know, that sense of like that, like it's not fair if they're rewarded when they're not contributing is a very like basic moral intuition that I'm not really trying to push against, right? Like my children have that, like my daughter, if I'm like, you both have to go clean up your room and then you can watch TV. And my daughter does most of the work cleaning up the room. She is effing outraged if her brother also gets to watch television. She's like, but he just sat there while I did all the work. Like, why does he get to watch TV? Like that sense of outrageousness over, um, you know, children are outraged by unfair inequality, but they're also outraged by what they consider to be equality that's unfair too, like unfair equality. Like if people get the exact same for different effort, like children get really mad about that too. There's two things I want to like just add to that, which is one, what do we owe even the slacker on the couch by virtue of him being a human, right? And like, he probably isn't owed um, a yacht and a million dollar 401k, but like, are we going to send him home from the hospital? Are we going to tell him to pull his own teeth? Right. Like though, like what do we owe people even who are slackers, even who are bad, like even who aren't quote unquote contributing. I don't think we pay enough attention to that, at least in, in where I live. And the second is, um, my colleagues, Pamela Hurd and Don Winahan have written a great book on administrative burden, which is like, what are the costs of administering social programs when you're trying to separate the deserving applicants from the undeserving applicants? And basically their research suggests that even though freeloaders bother us, we can end up hurting ourselves and the people who actually need help more by putting in this administrative machinery that like it's trying to suss out, like, is this person a mechanic or is this person, you know, the video gamer on his couch, right? So not universalizing things, even though it does activate our, like, very six-year-old impulses of, like, but someone might not get something even when they're slacker and they're not doing anything. Like, not universalizing things can make programs more expensive and end up so that the people who do need them are less likely to get them. And so at the end of the day, I'm just kind of a consequentialist about this in which I feel like, um, you know, I'd rather a guilty man go free than an innocent man be in jail. And like, I would rather have someone who is like undeserving of a social benefit, get it, than have a whole machinery in place that ends up hurting people who like, have legitimate claims on a service. Um, so those really are the considerations good, that I Yeah, I think that's a really good identification of why people who lean left tend to be compassionate. I think that's like <laughs> the best summarization that I've ever seen for that. Um, because for me, I think my indignation would overtake my empathy. I, I think that m- I would... I don't know if I would be prepared. 
the guilty man going free versus the innocent man going to jail like that's you know that's a, that's a much tighter decision for me to make it's more difficult for me to work out where i lie on that um what i thought was really interesting was you talking about unfair equality as well as unfair inequality um, yeah. and that's what we're talking yeah. about with that indignation the hypocrisy the concerns yeah. around yeah. undeserved it it definitely feels to me i would be really interested to see where your viewpoints are let's say that we get the sort of progress that we're hoping for economically in terms of welfare and poverty levels and so on and so forth um over the next 20 years 30 years i'd be really really interested to see what your um stance would be on this let's say that we raise the floor of welfare mm -hmm. so that everybody has basic human dignity right mm -hmm. now one of the problems is that we're not rational creatures a lot of the time we're more concerned relatively about our position yeah. within the hierarchy yeah. than absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you've considered this because if you offer someone, you can make an extra $50,000 yourself or you can make an extra $100,000, but all of your competitors make an extra $120,000, people will take the objective yeah. lower number so that relatively yeah. they gain more status. This is yeah. how we are wired. So for me, yeah. my concern is that it's status games all the way down now. <laughs> yeah, So I so I feel like, this is where this is a really interesting question. Like I, I'm not really interested in changing aspects of our psychology that are probably like pretty deeply evolved, right? Like, are we going to get rid, not of, like, rid of that hierarchies and competition? Not like, no, we're not going to. Um, it's more about like what structures can we build that satisfy and respond to those psychological needs that also take seriously these other moral concerns, right? And um, it's like, so the economist Robert Frank has a really great book called Success and Luck, which is not about genetics. It's about like environmental luck, like random opportunities that come to you. And this is a, you know, a topic that he takes really seriously around like, Someone's always going to want a bigger boat. Like, it doesn't matter how big the yacht is. Like, someone's going to always want a bigger boat. Like, there's there, there's going to be no, like, undoing of male psychology that, like, makes them not want the bigger boat at the end of the day. And so he's like, so what could we do with that? And he has a whole proposal around, like, a consumption tax, which, like, doesn't actually really change the utility that people at the top end of a of an economic hierarchy get out of like the status competition around goods, but does like redistribute wealth and like prevent this kind of like runaway inflation of like the cost of some, like some things that affect other people's uh, prices, like housing markets. And that's the sort of thing that I'm interested in. If we raise the floor up so that the redistribution yeah. basically is no longer required, what are we talking about there? If the people who aren't putting the work in, aren't putting the work in, but are living a life which is morally... Uh, how would you yeah. say respectable uh, by the the particular values that you've given? Um, I I don't know I don't know what we're achieving there other than reducing the imperative or the incentive uh, for those people to actually do something. This is one of the concerns that you have, like the the free rider freeloader problem, right? The tragedy yeah. of the commons yeah. is one of the things that comes out of it. Yeah. So it's I mean. I it's so interesting to me to hear you talk because I feel like, I mean, you're bringing up like is inequality, like, I, I think this is a really fundamental debate, like to what extent, like is inequality itself a bad thing versus like, we're just concerned about the minimum, but also like to what extent is work a good thing? Like a lot of your comments are predicated on this idea that like work, work qua work productivity is better than leisure, which is just, like, I'm not necessarily sure I'm even, like, taking that, like, as an assumption. Like, I, you know, the, the dream of technology was it was going to make work easier so that we all had more time for leisure. The we, and, the like, next part. So <laughs> you know, that we could all be Iceland and be like, okay, we now have a four-day work week. Like, that's, you know, the vision that I have of, like, what world would I want my children to enjoy? you know, in this utopia that you've described where like poverty no longer exists and like people have like, 
you know, a basic income and access to health care um, is not one in which there are still pressures to work 70 hours a week as part of um, being part of a prestigious occupation. Like, uh, at what point do we start to value leisure in addition to work? That's that's, I, that's a I'm fucking sure. fascinating question because so much of our self-worth, especially if you're industrious and conscientious, so much of your self-worth is tied to the work that you do. And you can actually even shortcut the outcome, the outcomes and the output of the work. And it can just simply be that like the Puritan work ethic, like I am, I, I take pleasure from the sheer suffering that is a part <laughs> of the work that I do. You can imagine these priests in the middle ages, they're hoeing, hoeing the garden outside of the church yes. and the sun's beating down on their backs, but they're doing it in service to God. And this is us. We're doing it in service to Moloch, right? Like that's, yeah. that's what we're here for. Here's, here's one for well, you. I mean, I, like, I find this so fast, right? Like, why do we have, I mean, the theory about the quote unquote Protestant work ethic is like, well, the Calvinists were like, well, you were predestined before the dawn of time to be either in the elect or not in the elect. And you weren't going to know, but like one way to show yourself and other people that you were in the elect, like that you weren't going to go to hell is that like your sign of God's blessings, which is the accrual of wealth. Right. And so and then we've moved into secularism and just like taken the God part out of it, but haven't taken the like, I'm, I spend all my time working and accruing wealth as a sign that I'm somehow good. Like, why are we, we need to be interrogating that more, a lot more, I think. Think in about terms where, of like, where our sense of self-worth comes from, because it's not I coming know. from the church yeah. anymore. Um, here's one for you. If we could, should we go into the genes and flatten them so that everyone has the same genetic opportunity <laughs> no, because we're trying to achieve this socially. So why not try and achieve it genetically? So I, I, there's a great line from Jabzanski who was a evolutionary biologist in the early, I mean, in the mid 20th century. And he wrote in science in 1962 that genetic ver diversity is mankind's most precious resource. Um, and I believe that, like, I don't, what I want is a society that is more like a meadow than a lawn of grass, like in where we have many different people with many different talents, which a lot of diversity that are working in cooperation and it's beautiful and not homogenous, right? That, that is a quality of thriving, not a quality of gen genomes, right? Like, Whereas a lawn is a monoculture. Like I'm not we, like monocultures in agriculture never work out. Like they're never, they're never good. Bad things happen when we have monocultures. And I don't think that there's, you know, the problem with, with society in my view right now is that we have so narrowly defined to skill that we have kind of a monoculture of skill and talent. Um, amongst who was considered like the top of the like elite or of a status hierarchy of an income hierarchy. Whereas, you know, one phrase that people use for it is like a pluralistic opportunity structure where there's many different genetically influenced talents that can all like different routes to success. Those are the sorts of um, social structures that I think are good. I'll never forget this meme. It's so useful. I've never been able to find it again. There's this guy, this really big guy, and he's sort of maybe about my age, like early 30s or whatever, like pretty good looking dude. And he's got a shirt and tie on. And he stood at the front of a bed, bath and beyond. And he's just <laughs> sort of welcoming this woman, welcoming this woman into a department store. And there's a thought bubble going out of his head. And it says, 500 years ago, I would have been a strong warrior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, I like I'm. I was like, I'm a woman and I, you know, I'm raising a nine year old, but I'm not an expert on men and masculinity. But I do think just from my observations of my undergraduates, when we look at rates of college completion, when we look at like political dis disaffectation amongst young men, this sense of I do have something to contribute. I don't want to be the person that's like sitting on my couch playing video games. Um, but I do, there isn't an opportunity structure for me to feel like the skills and talents that I do have are valuable, are prestigious, 
are going to like create a life for myself in which I can have a family. And that I think is a huge problem. From a gendered perspective, I'm going to guess that boys on average tend to sit still with more difficulty in classes, uh, higher rates of ADHD, so on and so forth, more antisocial behavior. Yeah. I mean, that's all true. And then I think particularly, you know, when we're talking about like, you know, male adolescence and male puberty, like this is a period of the lifespan in which adolescents generally, but male adolescents in particular, are really developmentally primed for risk for feeling like things have stakes. And we put them in high schools that are like the most boring things ever. And then they all say, I've never been more bored. I have no, you know, we have closed off all opportunities you know, unless we're talking about military service when they turn 18, for people to experience a like pro-social, positively, socially sanctioned forms of risk and adventure taking. And then we wonder why like male adolescents drop out of school and go to college at lower rates than female adolescents like across the board. Like we don't take their developmental needs seriously. Like we, we just actually are kind of terrible to teenagers generally um, in terms of taking, like we treat them as like deficient adults rather than like, this is a unique period of the lifespan that has its own developmental needs. Like how would we, how would we design a school if we actually didn't hate teenagers? Like, That's a I really good point because we, we, we molly coddle children and they're still cute. And there's, there's still this level of protectionism around them. And yeah, you, you bestow on teenagers the responsibility and the standards that you expect from an adult with all of the resentment of a child that has agency not behaving the way that they should do. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Like in my class, I give my students like a list of like, here are rights and responsibilities of adulthood. You know, like you can get married, you can be tried as an adult for a crime, you can rent a car, you can drink alcohol, you can join the military. And I'm like, I want you to, if you were dictator for the day, at what age should we be able to do these things? Um, And then at what age do we actually do them, right? And it's like, in Texas, you can be tried as an adult for a felony 10 years before you can rent a car. Like, that's insane from a developmental science perspective. And what we do is we hold them responsible for making adult-like decisions and when we're trying to punish them but we withhold the rights that come from being an adult, like such as voting or drinking um, as late as possible. And then we wonder why adolescents are resentful of adults. Like, well, because you treat them like petulant children all the time and don't design anything for their sake. So um, I could go on and on about this, but like we, we don't take adolescents seriously in our cultures. And I think that's a real shame. Frederick de Boer, who wrote The Cult of Smart, he agrees that genes and luck play big roles in life outcomes. And as a result, he's a strong supporter of communism. Are you tempted by communism? Um, I think that Freddie would describe himself as a socialist, not a communist. Um, And I think it's interesting because I think his, you know, I think his socialist, um, I don't know Freddie very well, just, you know, mostly through writing. No, well enough to call him Freddie. Um, well, we've been on like a symposium together before and he, um, he, I, you know, I'm pretty sure his political commitments like predate any interest in genetics, um, which I think is an important point, which is that, you know, observing that there are genetic differences between people, it doesn't commit you to any moral or political project. I think it's more, um, you know, given a moral political project, what constraints about the real world do I need to take into account when I'm thinking about, you know, how to bring this about? And so, I mean, that's been very much my case too. I was an egalitarian before I was a behavior geneticist. Have you read the book, Why Whites Run Slower? No. Okay. So this French guy, he looked at athletic performance largely being determined by genetics. And there was this ACTN3, the sprint gene, and there's an RR form for speed and an RX form for endurance. Yeah. Have you seen this? So I have read about this. Um, Do you know and, if there's any truth in it? Uh, so, so my sources of knowledge about this are two books. One is David Epstein's The Sports Gene, 
which is fantastic. I really recommend it. And he is, that book is all about the genetics of athletic performance um, in very, like in various capacities and various specific genes. And I think what's interesting about his book is, um, you know, I know David only through Twitter, like he wrote that book years before I wrote mine. It's on a completely different domain of human skill, which is athletics versus education. Um, But thematically, it actually ends up in a very similar place, which is like, yes, genes matter. Figuring out which genes matter is really hard. And it's never just genes, right? Like this is such a complicated, complicated developmental story. Um, And then the other source of information about genetics and sports that I have read is Adam Rutherford's How to Argue with a Racist which um, spends a lot of time on these kind of stories about like why some racial groups are quote unquote better at some sports than others. And he ends up basically in the same place that Epstein's does, which is like, you know, if you pick like one gene in one comparison, it can look so like such a neat, tidy story. And then as soon as you think about the larger picture of athletic performance, like those just those stories kind of like fall apart entirely Um, so I don't, you know, like this is not, I don't, I don't know anything about the genetics of sports performance other than reading those two books. So like, but you know, my sense of it is when it comes to really complex domains of skill, these neat stories about like populations in one gene almost never hold up to like more sustained scrutiny. Adam Rutherford called me out after the Robert Plowman episode. He tweeted something, really? he tweeted something mean about me, so I'm not friends with him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the genetic lottery. You know, if you were no longer friends with anyone who said something mean to you on Twitter, like in my experience, you would be like left with no people. Like there's you're in the eye left. of the storm. There would be no one. There would Makes literally be no one snarky. left. <laughs> Look, the genetic lottery. Why DNA matters for social equality will be linked in the show notes below. And if people want to try and bolster your dwindling. Twitter world as people continue to clash up against you, where should they go? So I'm on Twitter at KPH3K and you can find me, I have a website which is kpharden.com. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.